Facing from outer space, astronauts are struck by the vulnerability of our planet. That our Earth is not infinite. There's a limited amount of space, a limited amount of room for all of the water and the trees and the wildlife, domesticated animals and the people. And we all have to live in health and harmony, right? But what if there's an outbreak of disease? You know, like a pandemic. <laughs> what happens to all that health and harmony then? With increased globalization, the ease of international travel and the incremental changes in our climate, the boundaries that we have created, separating the globe into hemispheres, continents, and countries, don't seem to matter anymore. Not when it comes to the health of our planet and everything living on it. As a veterinary pathologist, I spend a lot of time thinking about health and disease, and I've become more and more aware of the impact that the environment has on the emergence, the spread, and the elimination of disease. The same factors that can cause ice storms in Texas can cause a previously harmless germ to become a lethal one. I also know that when it comes to diseases in people and diseases in animals, there are a lot more similarities than there are differences. Okay, all life needs the same five things in order to survive and maintain health. Air, water, sunlight, food, and shelter. And it's those same five things, whether you're talking about a tree, or a bird, or a cat, or a person. The problem is that the people responsible for maintaining the health of the tree, and the people responsible for maintaining the health of the bird, and the cat, and the people responsible for maintaining the health of the person are all different people, and we don't communicate that well together. And the reason that it's a problem is that we all live on this one self-contained and finite planet where the health of the bird and the tree and the cat and the person are all inextricably intertwined. And in the same way, disease in animals, humans, and the environment are similarly linked. Cats, birds, trees, people, we all live on this one planet, and the health of one of these affects the health of all, and in the same way, disease in one of these can result in disease in all. Enter the concept of One Health. One Health is a transdisciplinary collaborative of multiple healthcare and non-healthcare professionals, including physicians, veterinarians, nurses, epidemiologists, public health professionals, environmental health professionals, and journalists, lawyers, policymakers, and yes, pet owners, all working locally, nationally, and globally to ensure the health of people, animals, and the environment. In 2007, the American Medical Association and the American Veterinary Medical Association got together and formally adopted a policy that basically said that we think that good communication and collaboration between animal, human, and environmental health professions is a good thing for everyone. Since then, however, I don't think that this One Health initiative has been implemented in the way I think the AMA and the AVMA intended. Veterinarians accustomed to the multi-species or comparative approach to healthcare have enthusiastically grasped this concept. Physicians trained in just one species have been a little slower with an informal poll showing that when asked about One Health, most thought that it was some kind of new national insurance plan. 
Part of the issue is that our approach to healthcare has become increasingly splintered. Both human and veterinary medicine have become more specialized and subspecialized, with fewer than 30% of all medical school graduates choosing a career in general practice. Talking with young people about their dreams of going into healthcare is always so inspiring, but I have to admit I get a little concerned when I hear 16-year-olds tell me that they want to be a neurosurgeon or a pediatric oncologist, thinking about specialization when they haven't even begun their undergraduate pre-professional uh, classwork yet. I I'm not saying that specialization is a bad thing. Specialization allows us to have in-depth knowledge in a particular area in healthcare, and that allows us to give our patients the very best care possible, but it allows us to put blinders on to information that's not in our specialty, and that severely impairs our ability to communicate across disciplines. And it's this communication that is so imperative to proper recognition diagnosis, and control of disease. Diseases can be broadly, very broadly, separated into infectious and non-infectious diseases. Non-infectious diseases are ones that can't be spread. Examples are things like diabetes, heart disease, um, many kinds of cancer, um, inherited or genetic diseases. I work with animal models of human disease, which are basically, um, I study animal diseases that look a whole lot like human diseases. So I've been working in that interface of animal and human medicine for a while. One of the diseases I study is in Bernie's Mountain Dog puppies. These puppies develop what's called ataxia, or incoordination, when they're about four to six weeks of age, and soon they're unable to walk. In order to figure out what was going on, I got to work with geneticists, neurologists, and surgeons from both human and veterinary medicine, and together we worked to try to eliminate this disease from these beautiful dogs. Some of our work shone light on a similar disease in children, and I was invited to go give a presentation at a national conference on children's neurological disease. This conference was attended by both MDs and DVMs, as well as the families of the children impacted by these diseases. Escaping the bubble of my specialty and exchanging information with medical professionals of all backgrounds, as well as those people directly impacted by this disease, was one of the most fulfilling and inspiring experiences of my career. That collaboration led us to think of better and new approaches, and I think it's one of the great examples of One Health at work in non-infectious diseases. But what about infectious diseases? So infectious diseases are those that are caused by germs, bugs, such as viruses, uh, bacteria, fungi, parasites, and these can be spread from person to person. Many of these diseases are also considered zoonotic, which means they can be spread from animals to people, as well as people to animals. And as a matter of fact, if you look at all new and emerging diseases, over 70% of these were considered zoonotic. And you may have heard of some of these. Mad cow disease, West Nile, swine flu, avian flu, Ebola, and all of these diseases were caused by some disruption in that germ's environment. And that disruption could almost always be linked directly back to some new human-animal interaction. Coronaviruses are an excellent example of a zoonotic infectious organism. 
Coronaviruses are actually a family of viruses that affect both people and animals. And it's a large family because they are masters of mutation. Some of these family members affect animals, such as poultry, cats, dogs, cattle, pigs, and that's just a few. And almost all of these have more than one coronavirus. People also have more than one coronavirus. One of them is one of the causes of the common cold and has been around for ages. Another coronavirus caused the SARS epidemic in 2003. This epidemic killed over 600 people and sickened over 8,000. The cause of the SARS virus, the SARS epidemic, was linked back to bats and civet cats that were uh, sold in China's wet markets. These viruses lived in perfect health and harmony with these animals in the wild. But when the animals were removed from the wild, when their environment was disrupted, that allowed the virus to jump into a new host, humans. Unfortunately, the virus did not live in perfect health and harmony with their new host. And the result? Disease. The CDC reviewed the response to the SARS epidemic and ruled that the number one need was a stronger and more integrated coordination between animal and human health professionals. Fast forward 17 years, and in 2019, we see another coronavirus, a relative or a mutation of that SARS coronavirus, and now it's causing COVID-19, a pandemic. To date, this virus has killed millions of people worldwide in just one year. And in the United States, to date, over 500,000 people have died. Far worse than the SARS epidemic. If we're not prepared, what's the next epidemic or pandemic going to look like? The cause of the or the origin of the COVID-19 virus has not been definitively determined, but all evidence points once again to those wet markets. But this time, they're not blaming civet cats. One of the many animals that's being considered is the highly endangered species, the pangolin. Pangolins have a coronavirus that's very similar to the one that's causing COVID-19 and pangolins were removed from their environment, could that disruption have caused the virus to jump into a new host again, humans, and caused a new disease, COVID-19? When the natural balance of health is disrupted, disease ensues. But what if we taken a One Health approach in the first place? What if veterinarians, physicians, nurses, microbiologists, epidemiologists, public health officials, environmental health in, had all gotten together and tried to prevent this disease from happening in the first place instead of now trying to stop people from dying from it? Instead of waiting for the next epidemic, or the next pandemic, we should be training the next generation of healthcare professionals, ones who truly understand and can clearly communicate these interactions between animal, human, and environmental health. And we can do this. We can do this by introducing the collaborative approach of One Health early and often 
into the undergraduate curriculum of our pre-professional, pre-medical, pre-veterinary, pre-professional undergraduate students. And again, when they get into medical schools. And again, all throughout their professional careers. And we can do this by attending conferences such as Zubiquity, where multiple healthcare professionals get together and exchange ideas. And we can do this by taking care of our environment, knowing that the little things that we do to take care of our planet takes care of the trees and the birds and the cats and the people. Now, when it is so clear what the devastating effects of not focusing on prevention are, we need a new approach, a new solution. Because now, infectious disease anywhere is infectious disease everywhere. Our society's tendency to focus on fixing a problem instead of preventing it is not sustainable, not in light of our shrinking globe. We cannot wait to solve disease problems after a crisis. If we're having conversations about whether or not to wear a face mask, we're too late. So my take home message to you is the next time you hear about one of these diseases in the news, know that what you're dealing with is not just a human health problem, but an animal health problem is linked to it somewhere, an environmental health problem is linked to it somewhere, and we have to all be at that table to solve that problem. Then and only then can we protect our planet in the very best way possible by grasping a solution that's so close within our reach the One Health Solution. Thank you.